What's up guys and welcome to the Rebalance Podcast where we dive into topics that matter most when it comes to overcoming struggles, injuries and finding balance in your life. Everybody's idea of balance is that bit different so my goal is to give you different perspectives, practical tips as well as expert insights into what it means to live a balanced life. My name is Robbie Cassidy, I'm a physiotherapist and a health coach and I've been helping people reignite their love for challenge, overcome their fear and find more balance in their life through the process of self-development. Let's get into it. What's up guys and welcome back to the podcast. In this episode of the podcast we are going to look through Achilles injuries and how to prehab Achilles tendinopathies specifically. The reason being is that I know at this time of the year as people get back into training, as training picks up, as the weather gets better, what will happen is people up their training too fast and an injury that they may have had last year will very quickly flare up again. So I want to talk through basically a few things that you can do to help to prehab the Achilles before it flares up. At least that way then you give yourself the best chance to get through a season and to get through the year without having any issues with it. Now I'm going to talk through everything. This is going to be, I suppose, I want to cover different aspects of it, but I don't want the podcast to be going on for very, very long because I want to make sure that it's clear and concise what you have to work on. So to do that, I'm going to try to touch on a few different things, give you a few different ideas of what you can work on and what you can take away and how you can kind of implement it into your own training. But as always, you need to use this in conjunction with a physio uh, and use this information in conjunction with a therapist so that you know that you are on the right path and you're not doing too much to make it worse. Okay, that's really the main thing. So basically, I guess to jump into the very first thing, when you think of rehab a lot of the time, when you think of tendinopathy, what people often go to is they decide to rest it and decide to just leave it and do nothing with it. Now, the problem with this, although that works for some injuries, most injuries I wouldn't be too keen on telling people to rest it completely. I think everything needs a small amount of stress to build it up again. But with the Achilles or with the tendinopathies especially, rest is rust. So if you just rest completely, that's actually can be worse for in a lot of cases because then your tolerance to exercise drops and then when you pick up again it can flare up at earlier stages so it's really important to structure your training and grade your training so that you include strengthening exercises running mobility different movement based ones and then take care of your recovery in the background to jump into it in terms of the strengthening side of things when we're looking at strengthening what we want to look at is a nice mix of Obviously, concentric exercises, which are the main ones that you'll often do in the gym, but we also need isometrics and eccentrics. Now, these are the ones that people miss out on. Isometrics are excellent for tissue integrity, and they're very, very good for tendon integrity as well, in that what they do is, an an isometric for people who don't know, actually, I should say first, is where you're holding it, and you're holding it for a period of maybe 30 to 45 seconds. Now, This is a really good way of first managing pain and understanding what your pain is like. Because if you just go straight into concentric, once you warm up with the tendinopathy, as many may know, especially if you've been dealing with it for a long time, is that the pain can go away and then it'll come back the next morning. So your isometrics are a great way of grading that and kind of getting an idea of what levels of pain you're feeling. So what I would say is when you are including isometrics in your program, look for longer holds. 30 to 45 second holds and it doesn't have to be a hundred percent intensity either you can start off with like 50 percent 60 percent building that up and then trying to get to the hundred percent and then you're obviously then going for a couple more sets of that afterwards but i think what a lot of people do is they jump in the deep end they go for the really long one they flare it up and then it, it hurts them and they go at 100 percent for every rep so i want you to when you're starting off with your isometrics i want you to think about first how can you get the best out of this exercise so that it's not causing it to flare up too much. Because when you're looking at rehab, and I think this is a problem that people have sometimes, is when you go to a physio and you get your exercises and you go home and you do them and you go in the next day and you go home and you do them, you need to take this on yourself as well. You need to get a good understanding of your body. And with tendinopathies, it's really important to get an understanding of your body. Long hold, isometrics, 30 to 45 seconds. Exercises could include knee bent exercises or like your knee straight there's discussion now on which one is kind of more effective they said that they both have very similar activation the knee bent is supposed to hit the soleus which is the muscle underneath the gastroc a bit more and the leg and the straight leg is supposed to hit the gastroc but the discussion is does it really make that much of a difference 
I think it's still important right now until we find out and we kind of dig into it a bit more to use both variations. The other thing is when I'm working with clients, a lot of the time I'm telling them that you need to get an understanding of it. So you need to figure out which one hits the spot for you that bit more. For you, it could be that you flex your knee just a small bit. It could be that you bring it into you so your knee is over your toe. Or it could be that you lock out your leg straight and you feel it most there. But you still need to figure out what the best option is for yourself. So the only way you're going to do that is by playing around with it. Okay. Outside of that, what I often say is to go to the edge of a step and you can do it at home. You don't always have to be in the gym for these things. I think a lot of the time trying to figure out exercises that you can do daily at home are a lot better than going to the gym. I think that's huge. And then once you're able, then you can start adding a bit more weight. Okay. If you can, I would say to play around with shoes on and shoes off. So when you take your shoes off, you're changing the position of where you're putting the weight through. So if your shoes are off, you might be putting the weight through your big toe a small bit. You might put it through the baby toe and just see which one works best for you. Okay, it is really important. And especially when you're at prehabbing, because obviously you're listening to a podcast here now, you're going to have to play around with it a small bit. I think you always need to do that. You always need to play around with it and get a good idea of what works for you. Otherwise, when you're looking at eccentrics, eccentric is when you're when the muscle is lengthening okay so for a calf raise it could be when you're going from the top so when the muscle is fully contracted to the bottom okay and with eccentrics you can play around with time a small bit more but generally you're looking for over five seconds okay up to 10 if you can but try play around with it so that when you're lowering it down you're counting one two three four and five Okay, if you want to make the time a small bit stricter, you can uh, get a stopwatch and play it or count like one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. The problem here with timing it is that when you're under pressure and I think everyone is the exact same, that five seconds goes from a one, two, three, to a one, two, three, four, five. And then it's basically just becoming the same as like a normal rep. So really important, time it, put a timer in front of you if you can and yeah go for go for those the other things that you can mix in with it i would say are your calf raises your tibialis raises your hamstring holds or your hamstring bridge uh there's a few excellent variations of the hamstring bridge you can do the 45 degree hamstring bridge or you can do a hamstring bridge off a foam roller that's closer to the ground and basically you keep your heel very high with that you uh, you'll see it on instagram uh, i think i have it on my page as well you can check it out mobility tutor if you start doing that variation, what you can get is a lot more co-contraction of the hamstring and the calf, okay? It's tough, there's no question, but it's a nice one to hit the area, okay? Otherwise, you're also looking to include a normal lower body strengthening program. So it is important to hit other exercises as well, even though they don't feel like they're directly hitting the Achilles itself, Things like squats, deadlifts, RDLs, lunges are all really, really good for it. And making sure that you're mixing those in and out and changing up the variations. So you might be doing a, a stiff leg deadlift. You might be doing a sumo stance. Um, I know a lot of people are giving out about the sumo stance recently, but I like the sumo stance to hit the adductors as much. And like people are saying, oh, it's for great for glutes, but it's not really because your glutes are in a shortened position in the sumo stance. So it's actually more of an adductor exercise, um, but we won't get into that right now. Um, so that's a really good one as well obviously then you're looking at hitting the adductors and abductors as well so aim to keep everything nice and slow and controlled get a good understanding of your body so when you're going through the reps really feel it like really try get into your body and really try get out of your head and just start to feel it a bit more and look at including the breathing with it as well because all of these exercises can work on like improving activation of all of the muscles and then with that in general your body becomes a lot more coordinated it becomes better able to handle loads and better able to tolerate loads and then maybe the achilles itself doesn't take as much load okay because we have to remember a tendinopathy is a very simple injury in a way in that at the base level it's overworked and under recovering which is causing repeated inflammation and then after a long, long, long period, that can come to de- degeneration. But generally, most people are in the tendinopathy as opposed to the tendon or in the tendonitis as opposed to the tendinosis stage. Tendinosis is when it starts to break down. Now, the other side of it that you want to add to your gym sessions specifically, and as I said, you don't have to do these in the gym. You can do them at home as well. 
are basic plyos. Now, plyometrics are really, really good for tendinopathies when done at the right dose. So I'm not going to give you a specific dose here for this because it's going to be very different for each person depending on their tolerance and depending on their sport. Like a runner as compared to a football player as compared to a gymnast, it's all going to be different. So basically what I would say is you want to start off including a few more light, very, very light two-legged hops or pogo hops. And then as you're able and as the body allow, allows, you want to move into like a single leg hop where you're looking at line jumps, maybe lateral hops or like a triple jump. Okay, but everything has to be at a nice low intensity at the start. And what I would say is if you're doing your double leg hops and your single leg hops, either record time or record the reps that you're doing. Okay, like you could be doing it for 30 seconds or you could be doing whatever, 10 reps or 15 reps of it. If you do that, then you can measure what it feels like the next day. You'll have a good idea of if it flares up or not. And then you can judge your next session based off of that. Okay, because a lot of the time, as I said, with these tendinopathies, it's what it feels like the next day. That's really, really important. One thing that I've had a lot of success with, even myself, because I've, I've had an Achilles tendinopathy myself, and with a lot of my clients, is introducing skipping, like skipping rope. It's, I found it to help massively in that once you get it right, and I think the, the biggest issue for most people is technique. Technique at the start is obviously going to be the, a problem for people. It's going to be hitting off your feet. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're not going to be able to get a rhythm in it. But once you do and you start to build it up, for some people, I've literally seen it clear up a tendinopathy just by skipping itself with very little other changes to their program, which is crazy. There's not many exercises that I can say that I can say you can just do that one and then it's going to fix everything. With skipping, for some people, it just works so well. For other people, it, the technique and it just takes so long and they're just not as light on their feet, they don't stick to it long enough. Okay, and what I get, I like to get a lot of my clients, especially if they have um, a history of tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy specifically, I like to get them in the preseason to try build up to 10 to 15 minutes of skipping where they're able to do it comfortably just to help build up that tolerance a small bit more as well as the rhythm of it is so good for the body i love that idea of adding rhythm into your training because it makes a big big difference to how your body coordinates it how it reacts to it and basically the enjoyment of it i think everyone likes to be in rhythm with anything i think flow being in a flow state is very similar to being in rhythm and i think that if you can do things like skipping like running is another one where you just get into the zone you get into that flow state it makes everything that bit more enjoyable and if you can enjoy your rehab it's going to make it so much easier to get through it so as i said skipping plyometrics basic like double leg hops single leg hops it doesn't mean that you go straight for box jumps or anything like that just yet because that's obviously a high level plyometric but just playing around with them and seeing which ones work best for you and work best in the program that you're doing as well as the gym space that you're in is I would recommend trying out different things. Skipping, as I said, lateral hops, single leg hops, double leg hops, going forward to back, triple jump, anything like that, step up hops. Little light ones that you can control. They're the best ones for you right now as you're prehabbing. And then as you get better at it and as you are able to tolerate it and it's not kicking up, things aren't kicking up, then you can start including those higher intensity jumps, okay, afterwards. But just going straight for those at the start is most likely going to cause it just to flare up again. So start off with your basics, even though it can be boring sometimes um, in training, and then build that up. And then as you get better at it, then you look at doing your box jumps and your counter movement jumps and you know the drop jumps, stuff like that. What's up, guys? Robbie here. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I just wanted to take a quick moment to ask for your help. Could you please take a minute to leave us a rating on whatever you're listening to this right now? The ratings and reviews mean the world to us, and they help us to understand what you love about the show as well as what we can improve on. Plus, it does actually help us reach even more listeners again. Thank you so much for your support so far, and we are getting straight back into it right now. Moving on then from strength and plyos. I guess the next thing we want to look at is the mobility side of things. Now, with the mobility side of things, it's good to just keep a general mobility program in that you are getting everything moving. But focusing in on the foot and ankle and the knee and the shin is really, really important for this as well. Um, simple ways that you can work on this a bit more. I always push 
if you can do something, as I say, on a day to day that's not causing you any bother and that you're able to get something out of it, I generally push those first and then you have your rehab program on the side. For this, I often say, try to get into your bare feet and walk around in your bare feet. And if you can walk on sand and walk on different surfaces, grass, you know, different, different surfaces make a big difference. It just helps the foot to move that bit better at times. Now, that doesn't mean you just have to go into the gym and go barefoot and do everything barefoot. But when you're around at home and when you're in a place that you're able to, try pop off the shoes and socks and walk around. There's a lot of sensory information taken into your feet as well. And all of that extra information is going to help the body decide how better to tolerate and handle load. And really, while we're given the tendon a chance to recover properly and the information to go away, it's always good to get in that extra sensory information. So as the tendon heals, the body is better able to handle the new weight and it's better able to dis- distribute that weight. As I said, look at doing, like look at going around bare feet as much as you can. Then when you are in your bare feet, pack, practice picking up things like towels and socks, different things like that with your toes. I know some people will find this nasty, but it does help to build up the strength of your feet and the strength of the small muscles inside of your feet so many bones in your foot that they all need to move and they all need to kind of function properly and a lot of the time when we're stuffed into a shoe and you're t- it's tied up really tight they may not be getting the same opportunity that doesn't mean to say shoes are bad by any means but it's always nice to mix it up a small bit taking it off picking things up with your toes walking around walking on the beach walking on your toes is another really big one if you can walk around on your toes that bit more it helps to build that bit of strength in the tendon if you're going up the stairs look at bringing it through the full range of motion so you're actually you're not just popping up the stairs that you're stepping on each step and then you're like lifting your foot all the way or lifting your heel high and then stepping the next one lifting your heel high that's an, another way an easy way of fitting it in as well as practicing different exercises like knee over the toe exercises okay that's a really good one because it helps to bring your foot into or I guess not force it, but it does kind of force your foot into dorsiflexion, which can help the body pronate and supinate a lot better. So knee or help the foot, I should say pronate and supinate a lot better. So knee over toe is an excellent one. Start off non-weighted and then build into like weighted versions of that. Just to track back on what I said for a second on the picking up stuff with your, picking up towels and socks and that with your toes, I would go, like a lot of people when they do this are going to get cramps. I'd actually go to the point that you do get the cramp and I would play with it a small bit. I wouldn't let the cramp lock up, but I would play around with it a bit because that that's going to help the body to build up a tolerance to that load in that position, okay? And it's like you also have to think about pointing your toes as well as bringing your toes back towards your shin. So that's that idea of where you're looking at plantar flexion, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion and picking up stuff in both of those positions. Uh, it's just going to change the distribution of it through the foot now other than that we're looking at knee and shin moving making sure your shin is rotating well and accepting weight well as well as the knee so practice getting into that knee over toe position and then just practice rotating left to right on a single leg nice way of loosening it up you can do it before a gym session you can do it before you go out running really really simple way of getting the body moving and getting the shin rotating that bit more when i say shin i i should clarify for people who are more into the technicalities of it we're looking at getting the tibia rotating that bit more by doing that you can do it with a straight leg you can do it with a bent knee it's nice to just play around with it go on a single leg and basically think about your foot being anchored to the floor and then just rotate your weight left to right turn on the body nice and relaxed and you can hold on to something if you want to as well lastly or i guess one more thing on this side of things is practice putting weight through your big toe so if you are going up the stairs sometimes not every single time but really practice on putting your weight through your big toe especially if you're in your bare feet because a lot of the time with shoes and just with the lifestyle people don't have the strength in their big toe and it's 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 huge it's really really important to have a lot of strength in your big toe and it's important that the toe is moving well because if it's not moving well you're going to restrict the amount of pronation and supination that you can get and if you restrict the amount of pronation and supination that you can get pronation is like flat feet supination is like high arches our foot needs to be able to move through both of them it's going to affect the glute activation as well and i hate that idea of oh your you know, your glutes aren't working but 
in this instance, it does actually make a difference. So it is important to push off your big toe to get the most out of it. And the same thing when you're sprinting then, that's obviously gonna be another element to it. Rolling to the inside and the outside of your foot is huge. Now, to get to the, the latter stages of it, what we're looking at also is running management and load management. The next thing outside of, let's say, skipping as a way to fix it, the next simple, like really simple thing that you can do to help it is to start walking and to start covering good distance walking and making sure that you're changing the terrain and that you're walking up hills and walking down hills. If you are restricted in what you can do and you can still go for a walk, I would push at trying to get three to five K at different times and just seeing how you react to that, okay? It is huge. It makes such a difference and it can aid everything else with it. It just helps the body really figure out how to work everything again properly and it, and it promotes healing as well. It's funny, I had a client said to me uh, recently enough, he said, you really love promoting walking. And I was like, it, it does because it really, first off, like the mental or the psychological benefits to it are huge. Just it helps to clear your head. And with that, there's a completely different podcast on basically going into the psychological effects of tendinopathies and how much of an effect that can have on you and what's going on around you at the time and all that as well. But outside of that, just getting it moving, like that's a very, very low level plyometric, like very low level plyometric is if you're just going for a walk. And it's, well, I, I don't even know if I would call it a plyometric as much. If you're light jog, it'd be probably more of a plyometric, but it is, it's like low level tolerance building exercises and it just helps to get everything moving that bit more so i would really say to try walk that bit more and if you have training in the evening try to get a, a walk in, in in the day before training because that will help that when you get to training you won't feel as tight and sore looking at what you can actually do on the pitch when you're looking at a graded return to running this is really really important because what a lot of people do is they do nothing all winter they get back into training and then everything flares up straight away because they have to start sprinting with the rest of the team because they think everyone's on the same level and they just put everyone out sprinting together and then it flares up and then you're weeks trying to get it to calm down again so a proper graded return to running is really really important and i've included a link to in the bio of this podcast to a graded return to running program it's for free you can just go in click it uh, and download it it's really simple to use, but it's really, 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 really effective. It just helps you to get an understanding of how to build up your running. It's used for lower limb injuries. It's used for hamstring injuries, but it's so effective. So check out the link in the bio and you can grab that. Otherwise, when you are looking at returning to running, you need to assess your reaction. What's it like the next day after you run? What's it like the next morning? That is vital. It's so important to get an understanding of that because that will dictate how much you can do the next time. Check what it's like the same day, let's say before the warm up, or before, during the warm up, and after, and then check what it's like the next morning. And I would write it down if I were you. I would take note of it because it's a very easy reference point as you go through your rehab to say, okay, well, I ran 600 meters at 50% and it was a two out of 10 pain the next day. Okay, so that means I probably could push it a small bit more than next time. Okay, whether or if it was like I ran 2K at 50%, 60%, 70%, and 80%, like graded, but it's feeling like a 7 out of 10 the next day. Well, that was too much. Okay, so then we need to pull back a small bit more. Okay, we need to see which one is the biggest or what's having the biggest effect, the distance or is it the intensity? Okay, and then you need to play with two of those. So look at building it up gradually. Hit sessions too early are going to cause it to flare up. And the ground can make a difference as well. If you're running on Astro and then you come to the field or the road, that's going to have an effect on it, okay? So make sure that you are trying to keep consistent. If the goal is to run on the field, most of your training should be on the field. If the goal is to run on the road, most of your training should be on the road, okay? So obviously that's a that's going to chop and change between different athletes and different people. So get an understanding of what is important for you. As I've been saying the whole podcast, it is everything is individual here. That's why when I'm making this podcast, I'm trying to just keep it broad so that we can cover most. Obviously, I'm not going to cover everything here. I'm not going to be able to cover everything and all the inter-individual differences, but at least you have a better idea of what to do. Recovery side of things is 50% of the battle. A lot of people are struggling with this in that they can do all the work, but they're not sleeping properly. Their hydration is really poor and their stress is high as well as their movement on a day-to-day -day is, is 
shite in that they don't actually do anything and they go they sit down uh, the majority of the day they don't move around they don't walk and then they go to training and they go 100 percent to training and they come back and they do the same thing again and then they wonder why it flares up well that's it this is why it's flaring up because you need to have an active recovery as well you that's why i push walking and i push it and i push it i push it it makes such a difference and it's such a simple one it's a simple rehab and it's a simple prehab so try to get that one right load management is huge if you are going to be doing gym sessions and you're going to be doing lower body sessions try not to do them too close to your running sessions in terms of like don't do a lower body session and go out for a running session straight away after or don't do a lower body session the day before if you can at all uh, and and run the next day try give yourself maybe two days in between sessions just so the body isn't going out fatigued and it's easier to control you want to control the controllables here as much as possible and the more you can do that the better your chances are that you'll clear this up way faster a couple of things then just to finish off uh, that i'm not too keen on i'm not massively keen on a heavy reliance on massage and foam rolling it can help it it can help to calm it down but it's not my go-to um, I I think you can need to focus on these other aspects first and then if you want to do that as a side perfect the other thing is insoles especially my god especially going into a lifestyle and getting insoles anyone that's listened to this and you just went into lifestyle and got insoles I'm sorry but get rid of them um, I don't know how that could be effective you're basically just putting a crutch in your shoe I really dislike insoles for a lot of things and um, they are obviously have have huge effects on other injuries and other diagnoses and other issues but as a general sense just getting insoles because you walked on a treadmill the fellow was standing behind you and said right this is your problem and he gave them to you that's not very good <laughs> for lack of a better way of saying it like it's not so i would avoid insoles or getting insoles at these unless you absolutely have to unless your podiatrist said it um, and then your doctor and your physio and all said it and then your consultant said it Okay, then maybe consider it, but in a general sense, I'm not too keen on them. Shockwave, laser, and ultrasound therapies, I wouldn't be too keen on those. Um, they, just the research doesn't show that they're that effective, um, and you can spend your time doing something a lot better. Uh, they, are, they look cool, no question, and they sound cool, and they feel nice, but in a general sense, they have no effect. Um, well, I shouldn't say they have no effect. If there's a psychological effect, there's always an effect so you need to play with that yourself don't look at it as your primary rehab form okay just don't kinesio taping another one i actually got asked about this during the week as well from a client about for kinesio taping for plantar fasciitis i say it's completely up to the individual in terms of the physiological effect doesn't seem to have any effect at all on it and a lot of the claims they make are just crazy so it's funny to to read them but from a psychological effect the colors that they use can be calming and can have a calming influence on you there's always that aspect to it these are like the later stages like when you everything is right and you're you've done everything else right and you're just adding these small things um but yeah kinesio tape and i'm not massive on it looks good it looks cool but in general it's not going to make a big difference and the last one and this is one this is an interesting one because this is one that i have gotten myself and i did get myself before a match recently or let's say a couple of months ago is dry needling uh i've gotten dry needling as i said before a game and um, it was like i had really flared up there was a lot if i'm honest a lot of other things going on in my life at the time uh, like a few months ago so there was reasons that my pain was really high but in general it's something that i think is a short-term effect and i found it was beneficial short term so i found that i used it a couple of days before the match i didn't have as much pain during the match so i was like okay that was actually good but this comes back to personal preference if you're going and you're just not doing rehab and i know this because i see this so often and i see it in my own team and other other teams that i've worked with is they just go and they just get dry needling every friday night the club pays for it and then that's it and they go whole season doing that it never gets better their performance declines because they can't train as much and their fitness declines and then they're wondering why the issue hasn't been fixed okay but they know I, I think a lot of people know this is that you know that you're taking the easy way out when you're just getting dry needling all the time i think everyone knows that but it is nice and it is comfortable and it's nice to have people work on you like getting a massage is a nice thing there's no question 
but when you're really looking at getting back to where you want to be it is important to do the things that you have to do that is everything that i'm going to talk about today um i hope that was beneficial i hope that you're able to take those and implement it uh really looking at strengthening the different types plyos your eccentrics your concentrics and your isometrics use are working on mobility working on running management including walking including skipping if that works for you making sure your recovery is right as well as your diet and making sure that you're not relying on these other therapies alternative therapies or not alternative therapies adjunct therapies i think is actually what they're called uh, where you're looking at like shockwave laser maybe just getting insoles kinesio tape and stuff like that and hoping that they're going to fix it because they're not going to fix it they may help you a small bit in the short term but if you get everything else right you can get this right if you have any questions just send them my way send them on instagram at mobility tutor i'm on tiktok as well where i answer questions uh for like answer injury based questions you can check me out on tiktok at mobility tutor and youtube at mobility tutor but that's all for me today thank you so much for listening and i will chat to you all again next week okay guys thank you so much for listening to today's podcast i hope you enjoyed the show if you're looking to learn more about what we do as well as check out any of the mobility and prea programs we have available just head over to the description of this podcast and you'll find a link to all the programs there as always thank you for listening and i will chat to you all again in the next episode Have a good one.